thank you. I will, uh, what I will do to the, in these two days is actually deal with this question that Mladen opened of whatever one, two, and so on, or the cut into something uh, from three different aspects. Today it will be more focused on the, from the aspect of, let's say, knowledge, epistemology, science, what is real and so on. Uh, tomorrow it will be a little bit more focused on ontology or the limit of ontology and um, politics at some point. Uh, but I want to emphasize as from the first moment that this is not a kind of partition. I really think that these three things are uh, intimately and deeply related. That I'm not, I will not be speaking on three different levels. I think it's always the same story that will be present, but just let's say try to share light on different aspects of these uh, questions. Uh, so, as you probably know, uh, many of the recent philosophical uh, discussions have been marked by, in one way or another, by a rather stunning relancing of the question of realism, uh, triggered, of course, by Quentin Mayasu's book, Après la Finitude, which was published in 2006, and then followed by a wider, albeit less homogeneous movement of speculative realism. And it seems indeed that the issue of realism, of what is real and so on, is having its historical momentum today. And since I myself wrote a lot on this question, I kind of feel interpolated by this uh, relancing. So I will simply take this as an opportunity to raise the question if and how the conceptual field of Lacanian, Freudian, Lacanian psychoanalysis is concerned by this debate, you know, with the concept of the real being one of Lacan's like, central questions and so on. So what, is, what are the stakes here, if any? And I also know that most of you, if not all of you, uh, know Meyasu's book or his basic argument, so I will really just very quickly uh, propose some kind of a general mapping of the space of this discussion. Uh, so Meyasu's argument in his book consists in showing how the post-Cartesian philosophy, starting with Kant, he's the major main culprit, rejected or disqualified the possibility for us to have any access to being outside its correlation to thinking or to subject. And this is true for both sides, for thinking and for being. So not only we are never dealing with an, with an object in itself, separately from its relationship to the subject, but there is also no subject uh, that, that is not always already in relationship with an object. So the relation, according to Meyasu, absolutely precedes any object or subject. The relation is prior to the terms it relates and becomes itself the principal object of philosophical investigation. So this is called correlationism for him and contemporary philosophies are all different philosophies of correlation. Just a brief quote from Meyasu. Generally speaking, the modern philosophers two step consists in this brief uh, consists in this belief in the primacy of the relation over the related terms, a belief in the constitutive power of reciprocal relation. The co of co givenness correlation, co-originality, co-presence is the grammatical particle that dominates modern philosophy, its veritable chemical formula. Thus, one could say that up till Kant, one of the principal problems of philosophy was to think substance, while ever since Kant, it has consisted in trying to think the correlation. End of quote. And uh, let the insufficiency of this position is revealed according to Meyasu when confronted with what he calls ancestral statements or archifossiles. That is to say, statements that to, produced today by experimental science, but concerning the events that prior to the emergence of life and of conscious. Say, I don't know, the earth was formed four and a half billion years ago. So these statements rise according to Meyasu insolvable problem for a correlationist. How are we to grasp even the meaning of scientific statements bearing explicitly upon a manifestation of the world that is posited as anterior to the emergence of thought and even of life? 
posited that is as anterior to any form of human relation to that world. So he claims that for a coronationalist, this point of view, the point of view of these statements are strictly speaking meaningless. They are meaningless from this point of view. So I think, just put it in broad perspective, that one of the merits of Muyasu's book is that it has reopened not so much the question of the relationship between philosophy and science as perhaps the question whether they are speaking of the same world. And you know that Alain Badiou has recently raised and answered a similar question in political context with this emphatic claim, there is only one world. And I think this question has its pertinence also on the level of where epistemology or science touches upon, let's say, ontology. So it may seem, in fact, that science and philosophy have been developing for some time now in parallel worlds, in one of which it is possible to speak of the real in itself, independently from its relation to the subject, whereas in the other, this kind of discourse is strictly speaking meaningless. So what do we get if we apply the axiom there is only one word to this situation? Um, instead of taking the, on the side of philosophy more common path, reproaching science with the lack of reflection upon its own discourse, Mayasu takes another path. The fact that certain scientific statements escape its horizon of sense indicates that there is something wrong with philosophy. This is his parting point. It indicates that in order to assure its own survival as discursive practice, or perhaps, I don't know, one could even say in order to assure the continuation of metaphysics by other means, it has sacrificed a great deal too much, namely the real in its the absolute sense, in the sense of not implying any constitutive correlation. Perhaps I should just stress that what I referred to as a less common path is becoming a kind of a trend in contemporary philosophy. And Meosu, I think, shares it with several authors very different in their inspiration. If I just mention Catherine Malabou and her philosophical materialism aiming at a new theory of subjectivity based upon cognitive sciences. And in, in her polemics with Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis, she opposes to the libidinal unconscious as always already discursively mediated, the cerebral unconscious and kind of auto-affection of the brain as the true materialist unconscious. Yet if Malabu's materialism moves in the direction, so to say, of a naturalization of the discursive, or more precisely, if it represents an attempt to reduce the gap between the organic and the subject in the direction of finding somehow organic causes, so to say, or existence of the subject. And I think this is precisely why uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, was right in pointing out in his commentary of her book that the price of this kind of materialism might well be a respiritualization of matter, that if you just want to deduce everything from the matter at some point, you get a kind of a already spiritualized matter. But if she moves in this direction, then Miyasu takes the same path in the opposite direction, so to say, in the direction of the discursiveness of nature. Although he doesn't go all the way. Namely, his realist ontology, differentiating between primary and secondary qualities of being. So primary qualities are the ones who are supposedly, uh, who can be expressed mathematically, whereas secondary cannot be so. So in this difference, he doesn't claim that being is inherently mathematical. Uh, he claims that it is absolute, that is to say, independent of any relation to the <coughs> subject, only in that segment in which it can be mathematically formulated. This is the same aspect of primary qualities. So he preserves a kind of a gap between being and its mathematization without, I think, really addressing it. But, so the possibility of certain qualities to be mathematically formulated is the guarantee of their absolute character, so to say. 
So what we have here, I think, it's that Mesut's realism is not realism of the universals, right? mm -hmm. but then paradoxically realism of the correlate of the universals, so to say, which he also calls referent. And I will quote a very significant passage, I think, where you can see how he cannot escape, right, precisely sticking to this term referent, this logic of the correlate of the universal. He says, generally speaking, statements are ideal insofar as their reality is one with signification. But the referents, for their part, are not necessarily ideal. The cat on the mat is real, although the statement the cat is on the mat is ideal. In this particular instance of his own theory, it would be necessary to specify the reference of the statements about the dates, volumes, etc., existed four and a half billion years ago as described by these statements, but not these statements themselves, which are contemporary with us. End of quote. So somehow I, I think that there seems to be no way around the fact that the criterion of the absolute here is nothing else but its correlation with mathematics, finally. Not that this implies something necessarily subjective or subjectively mediated, but it surely implies something discursive. This, I think, one cannot say no. And I think, I think here we really come to the core problem of Meyasu's conceptualizations, which is at the same time their most interesting part. And I emphasize this as opposed to another dimension of, let's say, his gesture, a dimension enthusiastically embraced by our zeitgeist. I think lots of the popularity of his book is due to this. Even this other dimension, I think, has very little philosophical or scientific uh, interest. Uh, and it's a kind of a parallel story that goes like this. I think it's a kind of psychological uh, whatever uh, diagnosis of, of the Unbehagen in the culture of our present moment. It goes like this. After Descartes, we have lost the great outside. These are words that he uses also. We have lost the great outside, the absolute outside, the real of our own subjective or discursive cage or discursive prison. This is another word that functions very well in this context. So the only outside that we are dealing with is the outside posited or constituted by ourselves or different discursive practices. And there is a growing discomfort, claustrophobia, in this imprisonment, this impossibility to ever get out of the external inside that we have thus constructed. And of course there is a political discomfort and dissatisfaction that gets into play here also, that feeling of frustrating impotence, impossibility to really change anything, soaking in small and big disappointments of recent and not so recent history. And hence, a certain additional redemptive charm of a project that promises to again break out to the great outside, to reinstitute the real in its absolute dimension, and also to ontologically ground the possibility of a radical change. But I really think that the crucial aspect of Meyasu lies entirely else than in this story which has found in him, not altogether without his complicity, the support precisely of a certain fantasy, namely the fantasy of the great outside which will save us from, from what? I think from precisely that little yet annoying bit of the outside which is at work here and now, preventing any kind of discursive cage to safely close upon itself. In other words, to say that the great outside is a, is a fantasy doesn't imply that it is a fantasy of a real that doesn't really exist, but the fantasy in the precise psychoanalytic sense, namely a screen that covers up the fact that the discursive reality is itself leaking contradictory and entangled with the real as its irreducible other side or inner side, whatever. That is to say that the great outside is precisely the fantasy that covers up the real that is already here and that we need to tackle with or address. So, in any way, I think that to uh, put this discussion on um, perhaps more um, 
interesting level. I think the good way to start is precisely with the question of science, what science does, what it doesn't, in relation both to what Mayasu claims and what is psychoanalytic uh, stance in this respect. Namely, I think we should first ask what is in fact the status of realism presupposed by science in its operating? Is it simply a form of naive realism, kind of straightforward belief that nature, which science describes, is absolute and exists out there independently of us? I, mean, I think Meyasu's inaugural presupposition seems to be indeed that science operates in the right way, yet lacks its own ontological theory that would correspond to its correct, correct praxis. But considering the outline of his project, it is in fact astonishing how little time Mayasu devotes to the question simply of modern science, its founding gesture, its presuppositions and its consequences. That is to say to the discussion of what science is actually doing when it is doing uh, its thing. And contrary to this, of course, we, we can say that Lacan has an extraordinarily well elaborated theory of modern science and of its inaugural gesture. To some extent, this theory is part, of course, of a broader structuralist theory of science. But it is in relationship to this precisely that he situates and keeps situating its, his own psychoanalytic discourse. And I think this is really where one needs to start. The relationship of the psychoanalytic discourse to science is a crucial question for Lacan all along his work. But it's not a simple question. So, as you probably know, on the one hand, it presupposes kind of absolute kinship and co-temporality of the two, marked by the countless explicit statements like the subject of the unconscious is the subject of modern science or psychoanalysis is only possible after the same break that inaugurates modern science. And to a large degree, my paper will simply be the answer to the question, what does this mean that the subject of unconscious is the subject of modern science? But on the other hand, and this I will more go into tomorrow, there is also no less remarkable difference in dissonance between psychoanalysis and science with the concept of truth as its most silent marker, but of course also involving the difference in their perspective objects. Quickly put, one could say the common ground of psychoanalysis and science is nothing else but the real in its absolute dimension, defined by Lacan also as the impossible, but they situate themselves quite differently in, in respect to this real. So what is the Lacanian theory of science? Uh, in the context of a similar, very similar debate and relying on Jean-Claude Milner, this question has been recently uh, reopened and given all its significance by Lorenzo Chiesa, to whom I owe this entry into the discussion. Um, according to, to this theory, Galilean science replaces the ancient notion of nature with the modern notion according to which uh, nature is nothing else but the empirical object of science. So the formal precondition of this change lies in the complete mathematization of science physics. List. So the formal precondition uh, is this, and in other words, if I quote uh, Jean-Claude Milner, after Galileo, nature does not have any other sensible substance than that which is necessary to the right functioning of science, mathematical formulas, end of quote. <coughs> Even more strongly put, the revolution of the Galilean science consists in producing its object as its own, so to say, objective correlate. And in Lacan, you find a whole series of such very strong statements. Uh, I will just quote one from television. He says, energy is not a substance. It is a numerical constant that the physicist has to find in his calculations so as to be able to work, end of quote. 
So here the fact that science speaks about this and the laws of nature, this or that laws of nature and of the universe doesn't simply mean that it preserves the perspective of the great outside as not discursively constituted in any way. Rather the opposite, but not exactly the opposite, as I will try to show. So modern science starts when it produces its object. And I think this is not to be understood in a Kantian way, simply meaning, uh, in the meaning of the transcendental constitution of the phenomena, but in a slightly different and perhaps even stronger sense. And that modern science literally creates a new real or a new reality. It's not that the object of science, the object of science is form, uh, mediated by its formulas. Rather, it is indistinguishable from them. It doesn't exist outside them, yet it is real. And precisely these two things I will try to insist on here today. It, is real. it has also real consequences or consequences in the real. So the new real that emerges with the Galilean scientific revolution, the complete mathematization of science, is a real in which, and this is the, the crucial point, the real in which the scientific discourse has consequences, such as, for example, landing on the moon. For this fact that the discourse has consequences in it does not hold for the nature in the broad and lax sense of the world, but for the nature as physics or for physical nature. But of course there is always, a, here I quote Lacan, the realist argument. We cannot resist the idea that nature is always there, whether we are there or not, we and our science, as if science were indeed ours and we weren't determined by it. Of course, I won't dispute this. Nature is there. But what distinguishes it from physics is that it is worth saying something about physics and that this discourse, and that discourse has consequences in it, whereas everybody knows that in nature no discourse has any consequences, which is why we tend to love it so much. For of nature has never been considered as a certificate of materialism, nor of scientific quality. End of quote. I think this brings us to some of the points that were really opened in the discussion. So I think this is a really crucial quote. And uh, three things perhaps need to be really insisted upon from it. First, this shift uh, of account, uh, this shift of accent from a, let's say, discursive study of the real to the question of the consequences of the discourse in the real, related to this second point, that what is the definition of this newly emerged reality, and third, the problem of materialism. And I will just first briefly stop at this third point, the question of materialism, which I already quickly touched upon um, at the beginning with the question of the cere cerebral unconsciousness. I think what is at stake in this uh, brief sentence fr uh, from Lacan about what is materialist and that it's not necessarily the philosophy of nature that will get us there, what is at stake is a key dimension precisely of a possible definition of what is materialism, um, which I propose to formulate as follows, namely, materialism is not guaranteed by any matter. I think one could perhaps put it this way. It is not the reference, simply the reference to matter as the ultimate substance from which all emerges uh, that leads to true materialism. The true materialism which as Lacan puts it in an, with a stunning directness in another significant passage, can only be a dialectical materialism. I will just quote you this brief passage because it's really stunning. It's from the seminar, Dans discours qui ne serait pas du semblant. He says, if I'm anything, because he's being challenged about precisely this question, is he realist or nominalist, is he idealist and so on, and at some point he says, if I'm anything, it's clear that I'm not a nominalist. I mean that my starting point is not that the name is something that one sticks like this onto the real. And one must choose. If we are nominalists, we must, be, we must completely renounce dialectical materialism, 
so that, in short, the nominalist tradition, which is strictly speaking the only danger of idealism that can occur in a discourse like mine, is quite obviously ruled out. <coughs> in the standing quote. So one could say perhaps that the, through materialism as dialectical materialism is not grounded in the primacy of matter or in matter as the first principle very often highly spiritualized already, but precisely in something like the notion of a conflict or split or the parallax of the real to use Slava's expression produced in it. In other words, the fundamental axiom of materialism is not matter is soul, but precisely something closer to one divide into two. Or this kind of a unexplainable, undeducible gesture of a cut. And this is, of course, not without consequences for the kind of realism that pertains to this materialism. So now I will move to the first two points that I um, emphasized from this quote of Lacan. Uh, I will take them together because they both are two, spec two aspects, refer to two aspects of this new, let's say, dialectically materialist realism. I think the distinguish between, the distinction sorry, between nature and physics established by Lacan does not follow the logic of distinguishing between nature as inaccessible thing in itself and physics as transcendentally structured nature accessible to knowledge. I think the thesis is different and somehow perhaps more radical. Modern science, which after all is a historically assignable event, creates a new space of the real or real as a new dimension of natural space, so to say. Physics does not cover the nature, but is added to it somehow, with the nature continuing to stay there where it has always been. And there's another brief quote from Lacan, physics is not something extending like God's goodness or mercy across all nature. So, nature keeps standing there as, not as an impenetrable real in itself, but as, an, as the imaginary, which is why we can see and like and love it, but which at the same, why at the same time it is more or less irrelevant. And you probably know this funny story about uh, some, some of his friends dragging Hegel to the Alps in order for him to become uh, aware of and to admire the sublime spectacle of nature there in the Alps. And the, Hegel's only com commentary of this sublime spectacle revealed to him is supposed to be es is do. So I think Lacan would appreciate this a lot. I mean, es is do, no more to say about the mountains. Not because we can not really understand them, but because there is nothing to understand somehow. But if we say, of course, that the stone of which they are composed, it's so and so old. We are talking about also another reality, precisely one in which consequences of the discourse exist. And I really think that Lacan's definition of this difference is uh, extremely concise and precise and helpful. What is at stake is not that nature is a as scientific object, that is as physics is only an effect of discourse or consequence of discourse. This is not at all what is at stake. And that in this sense, physics doesn't actually deal with the real, but only with its own constructions. What is at stake is that discourse of science creates open space, opens up a space in which this discourse has real consequences. And this is something different. And in some way, we are dealing with something that most literally and from the inside splits the world in two. So the fact that discourse of science creates or opens up a space in which this discourse has real consequences also means, of course, that it can produce something that not only becomes part of reality, but can also change it. And another brief quote. Uh, from Lacan, scientific discourse was able to bring about the moon landing where thought becomes witness to an eruption of a real, 
and with mathematics using no apparatus other than a form of language. End of quote. To this, then, he adds that the mentioned eruption of the real, of a real, took place without the philosopher caring about it. And perhaps we can see in this remark a kind of problematization of a certain aspect, aspect of modern philosophy which tended to miss a crucial dimension of science at precisely this point of the real and kept reducing it to the logic of instrumental reason, technicism, and so on. So for Kant, there is definitely something more to science than this. But we could perhaps also see this remark as a hint at the contemporary coupling of philosophy and uh, what Lacan calls the university discourse, the minimal definition of which, namely of the university discourse, would be precisely a social link in which discourse has no consequences or something like this. There is some kind of a deactivation of consequences at work in this discourse. 